Welcome to the Thousand Amp Podcast, where we talk about indie game development and adjacent and surrounding topics. I'm joined today by Dan Cook of Spry Fox Games, someone who's done a, a terrific amount of thinking and writing about game design and specifically from an in, indie perspective. So yeah, thanks so much for, for coming on. All right, good to be here. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, so what I like to do is just to start us off with a little kind of origin story, right? How'd you get into the business and, and as much or as little detail as you want to give to, to up to the present moment, wherever sure. you want to take it. Sure. Yeah. Goodness. So, so I've been doing this for like 25 plus years. So it's all over the place. The story I've told a lot is I got started just doing pixel art up in the backwoods of Maine on my Amiga computer. And it was a completely useless skill that no one else around me for sort of hundreds probably maybe even a thousand miles shared and uh, i went to college and there was this thing called the internet which was super cool at the time it was this was back in the 90s and i started sharing my pixel art with this uh, there was this this thing called the demo scene where people made uh you know floppy disks with music on it and pixel art and it was this like what if we did art plus music, plus programming all at the same time. And it was this wild idea. Like this was sort of before the buzzword of multimedia, right? This was like super early on. That's amazing. And, uh, the, the, I didn't know you had a demo scene connection. The demo scene is like a amazing and kind of, I think slightly under known and under documented movement. Yeah, but it's like, really yeah, it was, it was kind it was kind of like, what if you took like, uh, nerd tech computer nerds plus the rave scene yeah. plus like a large dose of like scandinavian culture plus like i don't know plus art art this 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 futurist art perspective and sort of mashed it all together in the 80s and 90s to like make a community it was it was it was kind of cool and so so i for for the, like my freshman year in in college i was doing art for this and i made a whole bunch of art and then i hooked up with all these other people on uh, irc internet relay chat and uh, we would we would uh, collaborate and make cool things together so it was kind of like a lot like indie st game development now except th the concept of game development barely existed at that time. Like there were a few big companies like Sierra that was doing stuff, but the idea that like, hey, you could just make games. There was this one company that was also kind of in the indie space, which was called id, and they were making shareware and that was cool. But for the most part, it didn't really exist. And so, so as I was making this stuff, you know, I was going to get my degree. I was going to go into like chip engineering or something like that. But then a friend of mine, Ray Bingham said, just secretly bundled up all my art and sent it off to this random ass company and said, it said, you said you needed an artist. I know this guy who like, you know, does pixel art in his spare time. And uh, they contacted me. And, and at that point I had a choice because, you know, it was like college student, rural Maine. I could either go back, work at the gas station which was, you know, the summer job. That was the summer job. Or I could, you know, like hole up in a uh, room at the, at the campus over the summer and like work on pixel art. And so I, I, I ended up, the pixel art paid a lot better. So <laughs> I think, I think I was, I think it paid like, it paid like a thousand dollars a month or something like that. It was, Whoa. it was, it yeah. was like, for, for me, that was like, and an immense amount of money. That was an unknowable amount of money. So I was like, I don't even know what I would do with this. Um, that's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, I yeah. mean, that's also amazing that like somebody else was like, hey, look at this, put, you know, put you forward. And was like, look at this guy. I, I don't, I don't like putting myself forward in that way. That's not my personality. So, so I was like, okay, so, so, so I did that. And the company, the company was, was Epic Mega Game, current makers of Unreal and all, all that sort of stuff now called just Epic Games and released a shoot 'em up called Tyrion, which is still out there. It's, we open sourced it. You can download it. It's on literally every platform known to mankind at this point. And, uh, and from there, you know, like I just started like, so I was doing art. I was like, you know, I was a physics guy doing art and they needed someone to draw the UI. So I drew the UIs. They needed someone to figure out like 
what the features were because they didn't want to figure out what the features were because there was a programmer and a musician. Great, great. And and so I started doing some of the design stuff, but we didn't even really call it design at that point. It was like, someone has to decide what the features are. What what are we making? You know, someone has to do that. It's it's the boring work, right? And, uh, and so I started getting into that. And then, and then you know, and then we, we made it. We made a game with an early sort of proto version of, of Unreal. And it was new technology and the technology got delayed and we overscoped and made all the mistakes that indies make, like all of them simultaneously and after a crazy like crunch filled time in the mountains of like north carolina we said ah screw this we quit and uh, then what happened then we went on to then i bounced around a little bit i went i ended up in colorado at some point making sort of art software it was a game company that decided to make sort of almost a unity like tool wow and, and did that for a while so i started getting into making art art tools and i was still dabbling with games on the side Right around that time, I started writing because I couldn't, I, I literally could not stop thinking about games. Uh, so I started a blog called uh, Lost Garden, lostgarden.com, which has a whole bunch of game design stuff on it if anyone's interested. Yeah. Um, it phenomenal, goes back. Phenomenal resource. If yeah, it goes back familiar. like a decade, a decade plus at this point. But like that, that was written entirely anonymously, like for, at first, like for the first probably like ten years, seven to ten what? years. Like I, didn't I just know that. That's crazy. Why? Yeah, you know, why was it anonymous? Because that that wasn't that wasn't the point. The point, like, there's there's this whole like, you know, you got to be your personal brand, and that's not my thing, right? Like, I was like, look, I want to think about game design. I want to talk about game design with people, but it's you know, like. You know, I don't want it to get in the way of everything, everything else. Very um, interesting. Yeah. The, uh, the whole thing, the anti-personal branding thing is a funny one and interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Just, I, I think, I think it was how I was raised, right? It's just, you know, you, you, you're supposed to like be quiet, chop your wood and get on with life. And if you survive, that's good. And if someone <laughs> needs butter, you give them butter. <laughs> I mean, good, good values. <laughs> so, yeah. And then I, then I ended up going and making an art tool over at Microsoft and at that point, like just the urge, that burning urge to like make games was overwhelming. And uh, yeah, I, 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 I transferred, they, they allowed transfer. So I transferred back into Microsoft Game Studios, started working on some social, some social games there, started going to the Project Horseshoe game designer and, uh, you know, writing papers there. And then at a certain point, it's like, look, you know, Microsoft is not necessarily the best place to make games at least at that time yeah. i think that some of the some of the studios that are working there now are are, are they, they figured some things out yeah but I, I was like all right you know it's time to take off and i had i had a, a friend who was also working at microsoft david ettery and he he had been he and i had been talking about hey maybe we should start a business and so we're like let's do it and this was when was that that was probably 2000. 10 2011 so indie games were a thing finally again one of the reasons i had gotten out of games is because i really loved innovative interesting games and uh, folks may not remember it or may not have been around at the time but around around 2000 or so pc games started to kind of die off steam wasn't really a thing yet console games started to take off but console games were this very controlled like yeah. You needed to get your project greenlit. You needed a certain budget. You needed to be in a very specific genre. I, I, I remember going to E3 and trying to find an innovative game, and there weren't any. Like the, the one I found was Pikmin, and I loved Pikmin as a result. I have yeah. fond memories of Pikmin because it was like someone was trying to do some batshit crazy things, yeah. uh, which was wonderful. Yeah. But for there was this kind of dark period where there wasn't there wasn't an indie scene and there wasn't much innovation. So but so it's like, hey, there's a new blossoming happening. There's a new sort of like, you know, fertile period of, of making smaller games and digital platforms are opening up. Yeah. Maybe we can do something. And so yeah, so then we then we started uh, Spry Fox and we made a game called Triple Town, which as far as I can tell was the first merge game one of the first merge games, which is now a genre. I didn't know it was going to be a genre, it's but it's funny. a genre People now. have been talking about merge games lately. I see it coming up in the like social mobile, you know, more like business driven world. They're like, yes, merge games are now a thing. I'm yeah. like, oh, okay. Yeah, merge merge games, merge games. So uh, uh, Triple Town, 
Uh, was one of the, the OG, first, if, OG if, merge if, games, if not yeah. first merge games. Yeah. yeah. And it had all the attributes that they really like. Like we just didn't, we didn't know how to make money off of it at the time. It had millions of players and they retain crazy well. Like they stick around and they play Triple Town for years afterwards. I mean, I, but played, we didn't... I played Triple Town for years. That was my, probably the first like encounter I had with your work and, and it grabbed me for a long time. Fiendishly difficult game, Dan. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, at, at 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 the time, like I was really into like, hey, we need to make these deep evergreen games that have a lot of mastery in them that you can learn and grow of with. That's a nice way to put it. <laughs> yeah. And 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 this has sort of been an evolution for me as a designer is I realized that that's a very specific motivation, like mm. that urge for extreme mastery. And a lot of gamers don't have it. Like I would say the majority of gamers don't have it these days. Very that's, that's, it's kind of, if, if you look at Nikki's motivational profiles, I forget what they're called. He basically has done some studies on like the aging gamer and like how motivations change over time and how motivations change with gender and stuff like that. And the, the, the intense love of competition as a primary motivation or the intense love of, of skill mastery yeah. tends to happen in early, like early 20 and it may last a little longer but at a certain point you know people start getting interested in things like collection and hanging out with friends and you know it's it's just a different set of of motivations yeah so 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 as an aside one of the brilliant things that the merge game folks ended up doing they took triple town which was this incredibly hard game and they made it stupid easy to play like like you just you, you you get all the like you know overlapping short term medium term long term goals of like building these big chains of things that you're merging together but it's really easy to do you don't have to think very hard you don't feel a state of failure very often if ever yeah. and as a result people are like I can play this forever as a relaxing experience as opposed to a hard experience. And and that well, that turned turned triple tap that turned the genre from like hey here's this weird niche game that people really really love to you know something like Merge Dragons which you know I was sold for like 450 million dollars. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean I it's funny because I definitely have those games that fit into my life in that way like I've been playing Drop 7 for Oh, yeah. I've been playing it now for, I don't know, whenever, I think I started playing it right when it came out and it's been at least 10 years and I play hours of it. I mean, I don't want to say I play hours of it daily, but it's just the the kind of fidgeting, relaxing thing. And I just, I'm not even very good at it. I don't really think that much about it. It's not achievement oriented for me. It's just this, mm-hmm. it's just this kind of mechanical thing that I'm doing with my hands and my brain while I'm thinking about other things. I do it when I'm sitting on the phone and drive my, my brother business partner crazy. <laughs> you know, but mm-hmm. I'm like, honestly, I'm thinking better because my hands are busy and this thing is going and I'm listening and it's, it's, it fits into my life in a very, very interesting way that's very valuable to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at the entire casual games market, which was sort of bubbling up in that, you know, when I think of the dark period of the early 2000s, the casual game market was bubbling up and growing at that time. I just wasn't as aware of it as I should have been. So, so you know, these things, and, that, and now if you look at the mobile game market, the mobile game market is, of course, massive. It's, it's starting to dwarf the yeah. other markets combined. And that is almost not entirely, that is in large part uh, a casual game market. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's really interesting. And I think that there's a, it's funny, I was just having a conversation with somebody else today about how I feel like we were talking about, she had access to some revenue data from some of these games that are, in my mind, I don't want to be judgmental, but like insanely simple and kind of low fidelity and just very it's just almost different from what I think of as a game yet they're pulling down tons of revenue and obviously filling a need in a bunch of players lives. I feel like there's almost like a divergence happening of like, this is like some other thing. I don't know. There's many, there's many other things happening. There was a, there was a story told to gamers probably like it was, it, it comes out of the console marketing for the most part, the console like branding. 
which was there is a tribe of unified people who play games yeah. and uh, and it was sort of an uh, it's it's an identity branding by saying you have an identity you belong to this identity it ends up actually like tying you to the brand you are a sony gamer you know yeah. and yeah. we are all sony gamers together and so it's very much propaganda it's 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 a propaganda serving a sort of capitalist interest but people bought into it right they bought into it in a in a huge huge way but when you actually look at the population of people who play games, that's extraordinarily broad. And there's large portions of that population who play games who have not been exposed to that propaganda. So yeah. they don't think of themselves as gamers. They don't right. think of themselves as part of this shared community. And they're, what we're seeing is we're seeing games turn into hobbies. And each hobby is sort of its own isolated community that is separate and different from the... The thing that the console manufacturers wanted. The console manufacturers wanted gamers to all be a unified audience so that they could sell into them yeah. a stream of $50 products. Yeah. A gamer was in their sort of like, sort of, if you analyze them from a like, what's the ideal consumer? The ideal consumer is someone who buys a $50 game, plays it for 10 to 20 hours, stops, buys the next one, yeah. buys the next one, buys the next one. And that's all shifting, right? That's all changing. We don't want that as the consumer. Instead, we want the consumer who who buy, downloads the game for free or buys it, doesn't really matter to us, and then plays that one game for the next five years and is dedicated to that community and to that game. And so so the business the business rationale of what the, the ideal consumer is shifting. And so we're seeing that idea of like gamer as the perfect audience is, is breaking up into like, what is my hobbyist community for my game? I think, um, I think that's super, super interesting and definitely reflects my experience over the past seven, eight years. You know, I started playing Dota 2 and and then played, I literally played, I look at the numbers on Steam and it's like, oh, you played this for 3,000 hours. And I'm like, holy cow, you know, and, and honestly, I, I mean, I, I do take long breaks and right now I haven't been playing in a while, but like, it's one of those things where, well, first of all, it keeps changing and evolving and it's so complicated that there's enough there mechanically and everything to keep coming back to it and keep learning. And yeah, you get to this point where like, wow, I've been playing this for for this many years and I have this co deep, complicated mental model of this game, you know, like mm -hmm. like chess or something else, like where it's like, I know so much about this and I'm playing against other people who have a similar level of investment and we're all faking each other out and communicating mm -hmm. with the sh in the shared knowledge. And it's like, sometimes I'm like, I get moments where I really feel like, what have I done? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> is this investment worth it? And then moments where I'm like, well, this is interesting. Like, I, first of all, I'm mostly having fun. Sometimes it's horrible, but but I'm like, this is something new that I'm experiencing, and it is much more like some people's relationship to something like chess than it is to mm -hmm. any idea of like a normal playing Death Stranding or something. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of the history of of video games was like the history of video games as media that was put in boxes. And and like if you look back at interviews with EA back back in the nineties and the two thousands, they said, We are a we're a company that puts puts boxes on shelves. That's 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 what we are. And then that as sort of the imperative shaped like what games were. Games were things that you could put in boxes and sell on shelves. And then digital digital distribution has exploded that entirely and now You've got multiple revenue streams. You you know you've got in-app purchases. You've got pre-purchases. You've got DLC. You've got you've got a, a much tighter connection between the game and the players and the 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 players with one another within the community. That was just simply simply not possible before. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a little bit like the the rise of the the serial series and Netflix and how the kind of creative format has shifted to match the medium of delivery, right? That it's not a two hour yep. movie that you go to the theater for. Now it's 50 hours of, you know, linked linear content and that, that now works and is very engaging. I think one thing you touched on, on different business structures and different business models. And one of the things that's interesting about what you all do at Spry Fox is that 
you're one of, or at least in my mind, this is probably wrong, but you're one of a smaller number of indie developers who kind of do both premium type games and the, you know, mobile free to play business mm -hmm. models. What has been your experience? Because I, in my mind, there's a kind of, there's this kind of indie culture and there's this kind of mobile free to play culture. And I feel there's a, maybe it's an imaginary kind of conflict there, but, or I don't know, am I imagining that? No, no, I think I think I think you're right. There's different. I mean, some of it is generational, right? So there, there's uh, where games is old. Games are old enough at this point that we have uh, generational fractures. You know, it's sort of like this is Gen X and these are the millennials and the uh, I don't know what you'd call them the the millennial the millennial indie developers. Like, what is their background? Like, what is the background of the the indie developers that came up in sort of that you know 2007 to sort of 2000. 16 wave it was they were coming from a place of one they were coming from the sort of creative creative sort of desert of the 2000s they were coming from a strong like memory of console games memory of like very traditional pc games and so to a certain degree what they were is they they're they're reactionary yes. design practices there's a lot of nostalgia there yes. there's a lot of like i wish this game like x still existed but i could make it better yeah golden the, age looking back to a golden age and, and yes yeah yeah i never had that to me games are a weird ass experimental thing yeah. right games don't have nostalgia to me like whenever i see someone getting nostalgic about a game i'm like whoa you were raised in a church school and you're batshit insane because like 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 this thing that we were inventing in our basements as like a weird ass art project you're actually taking seriously yeah. and you've you've layered <clears throat> you've layered all this sort of liturgy liturgy on top of it about like how important this thing was that you that that uh, was made and it's like no it was a crazy art project by a bunch of like you know techno madmen and uh, and like we're surprised that it worked and then, but because you were raised with it as a child and you knew that you didn't know that it was a crazy, weird ass experiment, you took it seriously and now you're doing your very serious iteration upon it. And so that happens with a lot of indies I meet. It's like they're doing very serious iteration upon this cultural artifact. And, and there's a conservatism that comes from that. I think um, that's, that's really well spotted and identified. And I definitely feel that too. And I've definitely experienced that in to draw a weird parallel in musical communities, there's a whole group of people who idolize 90s hip hop. Mm. And they're like, we should go back to the real, when the golden era, when everything was good. And, and I'm like, honestly, I was alive growing up in New York and a fan of hip hop in that time. And it was really weird. There were people rapping backwards and wearing their clothes backwards and singing. And it was not this dour, conservative, kind of idea that you have of it, but they've edited history. And there's this very strange desire for cultural importance and cultural seriousness that they're kind of imposing and somehow being able to reach back into the past is safe. Like that becomes a stable mm -hmm. thing to kind of rest your cultural edifice on. Yep. Yeah. And I, I think this happens. This is a very normal cultural thing. It's probably yeah. healthy in the long run. But from, from my perspective, when I look at something like free to play, free to play was a, cause I sort of, I was around when free to play emerged. Yeah. It was a crazy business model that potentially could give development teams power from the publishers and which is exactly what it's done. Like if you look at a company like Supercell, Supercell is literally like a small development team that makes billions of dollars. <laughs> Who has so crazy. In, entire so crazy. right but they have like complete control over their destiny yeah. as a result or you look at something like that's more traditionally pc like eve eve online that also has given them like immense protection from the cycles of the industry they have 
You know, they've done all sorts of crazy experiments and a lot of them, but most of them haven't worked out. Yeah, but that's yeah. fine because they have this sort of like bedrock of revenue from the services that they provide in their in their to their community. That didn't exist. Like most, I don't know how common a knowledge this is. Most game studios that I know that make premium games, they generally have three to six months of revenue in the bank, runway in the bank. Oh man, um, I want to talk about this. This is a, put a put a flag on that topic. That's yeah, a, that's a topic. And, yeah, and so so like the typical like, uh, why do studios close down? Studios close down because they have no ongoing revenue stream yes and they have only a certain amount of money in the bank and if one project falls through the studio dies <sighs> like like it is it is literally living hand to mouth day after day after day month after month after month yeah. and sometimes you get a long-term project and sometimes one project does really well but for the most part you're barely surviving as a studio making premium games and i think a lot of indies are going through that right now right they're yeah. they're learning that the hit that they made is maybe maybe it's it did really well. Maybe it gave them three years runway. Yeah. Uh, three years runway with exponentially increasing costs of development, which is what's happening right now, ends up being not that much. And if they don't sign their next deal or they don't like have another hit, which is really hard, then then they're, they're, you know there's a very good chance that they they go away. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I this is something I'm deeply interested in, and I think to, to provide some context for folks who are new to the subject, you've written really well about and basically captured this idea of like, you know, if you want to sustain your studio, your game, if your game breaks even, that's basically a failure. You need to at least double, if not 5x, the budget of the game in order to weather those cycles of being able to have enough attempts to maybe get another hit or at least a kind of a base hit yep. or something to, to keep you going. I feel like this is, and maybe this is a hopeful side of the whole explosion in business model. I think it is a hopeful side of the explosion in business mm -hmm. models, right? That, that we're now having a lot of different ways to try to make it work. But I think this is something that is woefully not understood in our indie community that I feel like we're not doing anybody a service by not talking about. I don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a sampling problem. Like a lot of things are sampling problems. Like most indies, they're starting out, they they've rolled the dice once, or they're they're trying to they're trying to roll the dice for the first time. Yeah. And a lot of these patterns are things that you know you don't you don't see a distribution of of results until you roll the dice like 10, 20 times, and then you're like, oh, there's a pattern here. But you know they're they're basically rolling one, and they think like rolling rolling a six sided die, and they get a one, and they're like, it will always be one forever. That's what this dice die produces. And um, yeah, like so, so, so the 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 distribution of like, hey, there's gonna be there's gonna be lots of failures. You only hear about the successes, so there's a success bias in the reporting. You need to have outsized successes in order to like buffer against future failures. And yeah, that's just that's sort of that is the premium market. Yeah, going going back to the free to play stuff. One of the reasons why we went into uh, free to play is we said, oh. Games as a service, free to play, direct connection with the community, direct connection with, you know, like, hey, there's like, we're making a game and we're serving you and we can listen to you. And if you want something, we can give it to you. And as a result, money and value starts flowing back and forth. Like that lets us break the cycle. Yeah. So back around, you know, when this, this discussion was starting, like sort of right around, probably right around like 2005 or so, somewhere around there, I'd have to go back and look at the dates. There were early folks like Puzzle Pirates and folks who were, who were dealing with this. Yeah. There were some text-based MMOs, there was things going on in Korea, but we saw that and we're like, oh my God, like, here's this sort of like, there's almost like, you know, we're living on a planet where every 10 years, you know, a giant meteor storm comes through and wipes out half the life on the planet. And we've seen this cycle many, many, many times. How do we get, how do we break that cycle? It's like, and so free to play and games as a services was like one, one of the few bright moments in, in the, the history of game game business models that are like, hey, that could help us break the cycle. And uh, I don't think we as a studio has, have nailed that yet. Like we haven't found that sustainable community yet. I think that's um, I think that's super super interesting. I think that the the point about 
the finding a finding a community of players and working directly with them and serving them directly is really in line with what I see as the macro trend for all business. We see it in the consumer products area of direct to consumer, all these Dollar Shave Club and we'll send you a toothbrush, we'll send you this, like don't even bother going to Walmart, don't even go to Amazon, you know, subscribe to your toothbrush and we're gonna send you one every month. Right. And 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 by doing that, capture the whole value chain. You know, they mm -hmm. say, yeah, you just buy it from us. Like we don't, there's no markup. There's no retailer taking a markup. There's no this person and that person and di distributor and so on. It's just, we go to the factory and make it. And then we do some marketing and then we sell it directly to you. And I think that that is now spreading out through the economy because of the internet, right? And I think that mm -hmm. in games, it's a, like you say, it is a way to break that cycle and break out. And, and, but obviously it only, there's a, well, I don't want to say it's a narrow range of things that work in that model, but there's some key mm -hmm. decisions that you have to make if you're, if that's yeah. the model you want to support. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, 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 the economic constraints shape, shape the game you make. For, for example, it turns out that it's wildly important that your game have high retention. Like, like. You want to make a 20 minute narrative experience. Games as a service is probably not the right place for you, right? right? Like, like you have to rethink, you have to rethink the, the, the gameplay and the genre quite, quite substantially to make that happen. So yeah, these, these economic forces are big shaping functions for like the, for, I think of them as uh, art forms, like the novel is an art form. And like, where did the novel sort of come from? The novel came from, in part, not entirely, but in part, it came from this idea that magazines could se sell serialized chapters, and like serialized chapters were, you know, were a form of media that would keep people coming back to the to the the magazines, you know, week after week, day after day, month after month, whatever the cycle of of the of the the, the form the pamphlet was. But then then at that point, you had this big thing that you could assemble together into a you know christmas carol type story yeah exactly um, i was gonna say dickens right dickens is dickens dickens canonical. is sort of the classic yeah. classic example of that and so like throughout history the business model shapes the form of the art that we make and uh, yeah so so retention ends up being a huge one monetization is a really interesting one when i first started out i thought like oh my god and this is sort of one of the critiques of uh, free to play it's like the need to make money dramatically shapes the type of game you make. And in certain types of games, that's very true. Like when you look at ad-based games, you know, yeah. there's this ur there's this, you know, urge to say, like, you need to show as many ads as possible. And that very much shapes the session length and things like that. But in in-app purchases, like the more I've gotten to know it, mm. the more flexibility you actually have. There's, there's a, it's actually like, so I would say what I've discovered there is like, if people like your game, if they find that it gives them value, if the, it retains well, they want to spend time long-term, it's almost always relatively easy to come up with ways of like giving people things of value that they ca honestly care about and then paying you money for those things. And it's, it's less, it's less disruptive than I originally imagined. I think, um, I think that's important actually, because that is, I would say, especially from the kind of indie artiste crowd, that would be the, a key criticism, right? Like, oh, it's mm -hmm. this crass ruining of my expressive art here by inserting gross commercialism into the middle of the the sacred experience the magic circle right and i think what you point to is first of all that as you say that all of these media are shaped and defined by commercial concerns kind of at their at their start right and the the sacred forms of this generation were, were driven by the needs of EA to put boxes on shelves and say, yes, it's a 10-hour game that fits on a cartridge and goes in a box. And I think that getting the idea that, hey, yeah, there is a way to... Well, honestly, you mentioned shareware, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not that different. Yeah, 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 no. And, and that's why, like, for me, like, jumping from... Cause, we were literally making shareware games where it's like, hey, play the first third of the game for free and then, you know, you can buy the next two thirds, you know, this sort of Apogee model from back in the days. And uh, to me, like, you know, 
try and before you buy is like a morally more justifiable perspective than like we're going to hype up this crazy big game and we're going to spend a lot of money on marketing we're going to give you crazy beautiful trailers and beautiful art and then but not actually show you the game because we don't want you to play the game until you've bought it and, and then sort of do the hard sell and then have you buy the game and be disappointed to me that's like that model, as popular as it is, is in some ways less moral than the like, hey, I'm going to give you a free game. You can play it. You can try it. And if you find value, pay me some money on some things that you on on some things you optionally can pay me on. And if you don't pay me, that's fine, too. Like, um, I'm happy to have you here and I'm happy to have you, you know, be part of the community for and that, you know, that everyone else is sort of like generatively making the game awesome w- within. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's an interesting and an important point, and that's definitely something we see in the monsters like like Dota is the that the free players add value, right? That oh yeah, a, you know, there's a way, there's something for people to buy, and there is an opportunity for a commercial interaction, but that the free players not only can the free players come in and take value by having a good experience, but they're adding value by being a part of the community and playing and contributing yeah. and. You know. Yeah. Well, one of the things that's fascinating, I don't know how much this is talked about, is we're seeing these exact same trends happening on Steam. So the games that tend to do well on Steam tend to, one, they get these huge in, influxes of low cost players, right? Like due to the sales, you see these big influxes of, of people coming in, which generates money, but it also like beefs up the community due to, you know, that has suffered due to churn, you know, people eventually stop playing everything. So that's just life. But then the other side of it is Steam seems to really, really reward those high retention games, like high retention games that you can constantly update as a service for a long period of time, do really, really well on Steam. Totally. And, yeah. And I so think this it's is kind something of, that is not widely understood yet. Yeah. So, so like people making successful games on Steam are generally making games as a service whether they call it that or not. It's just, you know, they're, 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 if you're releasing a DLC every three months, if you're doing community support, if you're doing real-time patches, you know, uh, you know, weekly or daily patches, you're doing games as a service. Yeah. yeah. And, Which, and, the, and the, economically, that is highly rewarded. That, that I find super interesting. And I, and I agree with you that I think it's under-recognized. And I think it's especially under-recognized for folks doing premium games on Steam. They don't, like, the thing that was eye-opening for me was the talk by Nick Popovich talking about Slime Rancher. And they mm. had this very games-as-a-service mentality that, that really paid off for them on this one sale i mean they did do i think they did three dlc on it but it was a one-time sale premium modestly scoped indie game but they took this very kind of games as a service approach and it and it super paid off for them which just to me i was like what like but but when you hear him explain it it's his talk i can't remember the title but it's a gdc talk he gave it might be the only one it's it's very good yeah i mean we we released a uh premium game a cozy grove just recently and you know like it's not necessarily like a clear fit for steam like we we, it's an animal crossing like game and you think oh animal crossing that's been out 20 years everybody knows what animal crossing is well speaking of divergent communities animal crossing has been on nintendo platforms only and steam is not a nintendo platform and so like most of the people playing cozy grove have never even heard of animal crossing or they've heard of it but they've never they're like they're like wait you only get to play a little bit each day like like that's crazy that's like the weirdest worst idea ever like i've never seen a game that ever does this before and i'm like it's this this genre has literally been out for 20 years and it has millions tens upon ten millions of of fans and they're like i've never seen a game like this this is so horrible this is bad this is a bad idea people don't innovate in this direction the world will end if you do and i'm like we're not innovating like we're literally not innovating here but it's so it's fascinating <laughs> to me that is like i'm like what <laughs> that is unbelievable i mean uh, a- animal crossing new horizons literally i think it sold 40 million copies or something right. like that like in an audience of, you know, a billion plus game players, 40 million is nothing, right? It's a niche title. 
Like there are more people familiar with Doodle Jump than there are familiar with uh, with Animal Crossing or merge games for that. Kind of crazy thought, but it really but, is, yeah. <laughs> but but as as a result, like that game is not a great fit for Steam. You know, it's it's a more of a casual game. It's more uh, women friendly. You know, it's it's uh, in a genre that is totally unfamiliar. They're familiar with Stardew Valley. They're like, why isn't it like Stardew Valley? But they're not familiar with Animal Crossing. But we've taken this sort of games as a service approach, and where where, where we've done like multiple updates and we're coming up with a free DLC and the community really responds well. It's a great, lovely community that we're building sort of within within the broader, more toxic Steam community. And it, it feels it feels really good. So I I find that incredibly interesting. First of all, yeah, it's just kind of mind bending, right? But it, but it's I, I think it was Tom Francis who did Gunpoint and Heat Signature and he did a he did a presentation that was like pretty similar. He was like, okay, something like he sold a lot of copies of Gunpoint and he was like, yeah, but that means like 0.001% of just the players on Steam have like played it and therefore it's like 0%. <laughs> you know? Right. It's, yeah. It's like this was commercially successful. I made enough money to fund my next title, but 0% of people like know about it or know what it is and it's just like, what the? Yeah. There, there, is, there is an analysis out there someplace and I, I Please don't quote me on these numbers because they're probably badly wrong. But if you look at like you look at you basically look at the Steam audience and then you take take Valve's games off the top, which is mm. a good whatever twenty to forty percent or whatever. Then you take so crazy too. I'm like, what the hell? Yeah, yeah. And then you then you take then you take the the big the big blockbuster AAA titles off. And that's another huge percent. And then you take sort of like, there's a handful of like really, really strong niche titles off. And then you're kind of left with like, well, here are the indie titles. And what percentage of the Steam market are the indie titles? And the number that I saw was, it's around 1%. Is that, that's revenue? Uh, I think that's, that's revenue. Yeah. It might be users. I don't know if it's users or revenue, but yeah. Insane. It's a very small percentage. There's, there's this tiny, tiny sort of like the scum on the surface of the planet. <laughs> the film. Right? The film, you know, like on the surface of the planet is, is which is life and it's vibrant and it's wonderful and it's exactly. indie life. But then there's the bulk of everything else that is actually Steam's business. Man. Which, and and in, that, yeah. it, in, in that perspective, like it's kind of amazing that Steam supports indies as much as they do yeah that's kind of what i was going to say is people give steam a lot of heat but the truth is from my perspective what they're doing like it's they're way more indie friendly than they need to be put it that way right from a yeah. pure business perspective and i think it's because the people at valve are genuinely games people many of them right and so they mm -hmm. there is a sense of the cultural importance of the medium and so there's some sense of stewardship or custodian that motivates that but yeah like as you say from a revenue perspective it's like they would be better yeah. off just... it, it, it also ends up being smart because it ends up finding the the unexpected hits so yes. you get like like you know PUBG is the sort of thing where it's like where does that show up first where do these you know you know where did where did uh, third person you know battle royale type survival game type things start to show up first like those things started to show up on Steam first right yeah. because it 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 was it 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 allowed people to say hey here's this weird ass experiment and it can blow, blow up into a big big game so and they capture a piece of that revenue so they're they're happy Right, right. And that, that's an interesting point, actually. Steam as a kind of Petri dish incubator, which has the scale and the infrastructure that if something, and, and the kind of vi all this machine learning algorithmic front page stuff that they're doing so that it is, anything that gets momentum and kind of can get above the certain threshold and above the fold can then get this gasoline thrown on it and catch fire. And they are, with their tooling and their whole, you know, people yell at, and I think I've even kind of yelled at Steam, not yelled at them literally, but like complained about, oh, Steam should do more curation. Why aren't there more humans in the loop? But from that perspective, you start to think, actually this whole algorithmic thing is probably more friendly to the Among Us or the kind of weird really unexpected 
indie hits that might pop off that probably wouldn't get through a curation pass. Yeah, maybe it's it's honestly really hard to tell. Yeah. It's really really hard to tell. There's a there's a famous study about music and like does the quality of music matter about which music becomes popular? And it turns out that as long as you reach a certain base level of competence in your music, like your music isn't complete garbage, like it yeah. reach the, reaches the like, hey, someone listening to this with no other outside influence says, you know, it's not horrible. Not that it's great. They don't say it's great. They just say it's not horrible. That's the level of quality you need to become a breakout hit. And and beyond that, it's kind of it's kind of tastemakers and 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 network hubs that end up determining what becomes a hit. So if Steam is that sort of like hey, this is the sing- signal multiplier and it's going to multiply your signal in particular ways, that's going to determine what becomes a hit. If the curator is the thing that multiplies the signal in particular right. ways, that's going to determine what becomes the hit. But the idea that the idea that games are of a particular quality and like this one is has manifest destiny that it will succeed, that's not typically how media works. Yeah. It's it's a, it's a little bit of a crapshoot in that regard. Yeah, and I think we could argue if we're talking about that as a kind of a network and a system that the role of the curators now is being played by YouTube and Twitch, right? They're the ones who are setting the spark and creating that first push of momentum for for some of these hits, especially the more unmarketed hits. Yeah, so sometimes there's also, I mean, we live in a capitalist world, so there's there's money play has interesting feedback. Like like if you look at something like Apex Legends, Apex Legends was an engineered hit due to money flowing to influencers who then promoted it. And then people are like, oh, when influencers recommend stuff, you know, people have these parasocial relationships, which yeah. is they want to emulate their celebrities. And so they emulate the influencers by also playing the same games. And uh, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, so they, they use money to successfully hack the influencer network to make Apex Legends a hit. And it was very successful for them. And that's a that's a very common tactic. That is, you know, there's an immense amount of money flowing to influencers right now. So I've I've got my 12 year old son is a fairly serious Apex Legends player. So I have a, a front row seat to this whole dynamic. And it's interesting living with a 10 and a, my two boys are 10 and 12. And I definitely get a major view of this process happening, you know, of whatever they're playing is have is basically driven by YouTube. Mm-hmm. It's what they want me to buy them is driven by YouTube. Right now, my younger son is on a Minecraft thing because of the whole Dream SMP thing. And, oh, know, yeah. You know, Minecraft is back, you know. Minecraft uh, ever go away. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm like, I'm pro Minecraft, basically. Uh, obviously, not just politics aside, you know. I'm like, yeah, great. If you, Minecraft is back. I'm ha- that better that than, honestly, like Apex. I try to play, you know, we would play squads, me and my two sons. And they're actually better than me at this point, which is wild as a... 42 year old man, but it's so hard and it's so unforgiving and it's so rage induced. I had a predominantly negative experience with it. And as somebody who plays competitive games like Dota and whatever, I'm like, this is, there's a problem here. This is not, this is like an unpleasant experience, at, at least at this point in the cycle, right? Probably earlier on when there was like a bigger flood of less experienced people, it might have been more forgiving. But right now mm-hmm. it's like, oof. It's it's uh it's a tough one. No, I think that's a yeah. No, go ahead. The one thing I like about Apex, which is, I don't know, this is this is my design geekery. The ping system that they have for nonverbal communication. Very strong. Beautiful, beautiful. Strong. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm a, I'm an omnivore, right? So like, whenever I see a game that, like most games, I have super weird taste in games. Like my ideal game is I want to play Breath of the Breath of the Wild with no combat. Like that's that's my ideal game, right? Yeah. But they don't make that game, right? That game doesn't really exist anywhere. And so like, what I do is I go into games. I see something like Apex Legends, which I can't play. Like I'm too slow i'm too stupid i'm of the wrong generation like there's a whole bunch of issues my hormone levels are not amped up to like pre pre preteen levels of anguish and so so like like i could you know say look at this thing i'm just gonna throw it away and be angry about it but i'm like no no there's actually some amazing design work there and as an omnivore let's go and like take a little bit and see if we can at some point transform it into something else elsewhere 
I totally agree with you about the ping system in Apex. It's absolutely, it's absolutely brilliant, highly functional and playable and feels like part of the game, not some annoying chat wheel or something. It's very organically like right there in the loop. The other thing that is wonderful and joyful in Apex is the movement. Mm -hmm. Just the pure character movement sliding around, the fact that you can vault and climb over basically anything. If you just push forward into a wall long enough, you'll like climb it and animate over it. And that mm -hmm. as a feeling of being like, of almost never being brought to a dead stop is is joyful. So yeah, there's, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, a great achievement as a game and uh, there's a lot to recommend it for sure. But yeah, it's in a, it's in a funny moment in its cycle in terms of its player base. I think yeah. that, okay, I want to do a little bit of a, a left turn here because we've been, yeah, yeah, yeah. we've been talking a lot about the biz business perspective. I think one of the things that you have written eloquently about, and that is a, this is a, a little self-serving turn in the conversation, but is basically how to be a good game designer, which turns out to be incredibly hard. <laughs> Yeah, And I think that to narrow that down, because that's obviously a big topic, you know, looking at kind of indie scale projects and the indie scale commercial projects, right? So saying, mm -hmm. okay, we're not, this is not pure avant-garde. This is commercial. It's a commercial video game that somebody's going to try to sell. How do we get better at the pure design part of that? Mm. Yeah, so it's a super hard problem, incredibly hard problem. I mean, a lot of it is really boring stuff. A lot of it is, what are you trying to build, Yeah. right? Like, be clear about what you're trying to build. What are your goals? What are your constraints? What are, do you have limits in terms of resources? Be honest about that. What are your priorities for the things that you're going to build relative to your constraints and your goals? Like, list out the stuff you wanna build prioritize it. What order do you need to build it in in order to get something playable as soon as possible? How can you make your content such that you can make your content efficiently with like, like I use a thing called, you know, content templates, content chunks, where it's like, look, I'm only going to have four types of content in this entire game. This is what this is what a wall looks like. This is what a floor looks like. This is what an enemy looks like. And we're going to define those pretty rigorously. And I know I want to be a crazy, wacky person, and I've got Lua and I can script shit, but I'm going to make 20 of those things in those templates, and that's going to be my scope. And so, so a lot of it is kind of setting up all those boring production things that you need to do. And that lets you make a game. It doesn't say it's going to let you make the right game but it lets you at least make a game. And what I see a lot, like we struggle with all the time, simply making a game is hard. Simply like making a game to a budget and getting it out the door is shockingly difficult. If I were to say like, what's Spry Fox's superpower is we ship games, like which, which doesn't sound like a big deal. There's a lot of people shipping games, but it turns out that it's really, really hard. So it's they a like- a big fucking deal, bro. It's a yeah. big fucking deal. <laughs> <laughs> so so like on our on our last game you know we scheduled it for an 18 month thing and we went i think two to three months over and we were originally going to have a team of 10 people but we ended up having a team of like 20 people on it wow. which yeah and when you talk about escalating cost curves but from a budgeting perspective i consider that a success right we weren't 2x over we were only like whatever it was you know 20 percent over on on our on our schedule and like I don't know, like, yes, it took more people and yes, that was painful, but I'm glad that we did it because it gave the game the, the space that it needed to do. But so, so from, from some certain perspectives, that's a complete disastrous failure in that, like, you know, in terms of like time and people and all that sort of stuff, it ended up being a lot of time and people. But from my perspective, it's like, wow, that's like one of the best managed projects that we've done, which says something more about the other projects than it does say something about this one, right? So just making games is hard. So like as a designer, I'm constantly thinking about production stuff. I'm just constantly thinking, because it's not like, like there's this idea like, oh, you have an idea and hey, it's a cool idea and we're gonna make the best game ever. And like, isn't that a precious gem of an idea? Really that gem of an idea has to go through like, 
how do we make this damn thing? Like yeah. who's involved? What's the budget? Who are the people? How do we scope it down? How do we standardize it? How do we remove risk? All that stuff is a design activity. So, so I don't know. I think about that a lot. That's one way that over the past like 10 years, I've gotten better as a designer is actually thinking more of the, about those, those type of issues. Uh, I think that's, I mean, I, I think that's a great, well, there's a couple, couple pieces I want to grab of that, but just to react to what you just said, I think that working within the constraints, designing into a production process, designing into a resource structure as the kind of, you know, as one of the major creative responsibilities of the game designer. Now, this is not the job. I mean, the producer has their job, and these are all in the domain of the producer as well, right? But to say, hey, you know, it's a funny thing. People talk about, is there value in ideas? Everybody's got ideas. Ideas are a dime a dozen, right? But it's like, well, an idea that can actually be executed is maybe different and maybe more valuable, you know? You know, just not that, it's not the, I think a lot of people, like you say, you're like, oh, blue sky, we're just going to like dream up this kind of like amazing fantasy. But of course, it's got to run through a kind of a reality wood chipper to, to come into existence and or a Rube Goldberg, Rube Goldberg machine is maybe a better yeah. image, right? <laughs> but and so being able to design something that's going to keep its structure and be intact at the end of that process is is the is the goal, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and like there's there, you end up finding these like sort of, I don't know, I, I call them design architectures. There's these underlying structures to what you're building. It's not this amorphous, amorphous mass of features. There's a structure for like how you're delivering content, the pacing that you're delivering content, like what sort of, I think there's this, this idea I think of like how weight bearing are the mechanics of this game? So there's like your goals, like I want to have a sense of exploration, right? And it's like, I, I've got this cool idea. It's like, well, how much of the, the, you need to deliver on the promise of exploration. How much weight is this mechanic or this feature going to bear? And if it bears a lot, then it's really risky because like if it fails, then you've, you've, you've not met your promise. You've got nothing. Uh, yeah. You've got nothing. Uh, so you want to make it a, 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 a you want to make the, the weight bearing features like low risk and robust. So you're going to put a lot of effort into them, but you don't want to be too risky and crazy with your ideas because then they might break and not work. But then the flip side of it is if there's this other feature you're really excited about, but it doesn't bear any weight at all, you can, you can either chop it you can throw it away or you can say we can we can we can choose to be risky in that non weight bearing area because it's not going to matter right it's not it's not actually going to matter if it fails uh, the wall is not going to fall down right right the game is still going to survive so so when we built the sort of design architecture of cozy grove Cozy Grove is this loosely coupled set of mini game like activities and sort of this daily, daily pacing of delight. Every day you log in, there's something delightful, which lets us mix things up. So like the the risk on any one element is less because like I have other elements and I can, I, you know, I can I can put in a different activity or if this if this activity fails, that's OK. We just we just do that less often. Right. You're and so now I've got doing that. It, that's not kind of your core loop. Now you have a mix. of yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. And so 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 we, we try to build this robust design or content architecture that allows us to mitigate risk on the various load bearing elements of the design in order to meet our whatever our, our, our experiential goals are. For example, in that game, daily delight was an experiential goal. And so, so this is the kind of thinking that goes on in sort of like, how do I become a better designer? It's like, these are kind of the systems I, I think about in my head and I apply those to a game. I think that's super, super interesting and valuable. And I love that idea of a load bearing feature or mechanic as a kind of like, how much weight are we going to put on this and how much risk are we going to take with this? I think this is an interesting point to one of the things that you were talking about recently on Twitter and everybody should follow Dan on Twitter. It's on the, it's on the screen. The is combat games with no combat, like kind of the cost of having combat in a game and it not being that 
or not being as good as the best combat, right? And right. is combat the price of admission? Or can we just sidestep combat completely? And like, obviously, Cozy Grove, there's no shooting, yeah. you know. I think that's an interesting one, right? Because combat, or what you kind of alluded to in your in your thread or your posts was like, because combat is so familiar, now mm -hmm. there's this kind of insanely high standard for what it's got to feel like and be like. And so, like, should we even try to climb that mountain or, or, do, mm -hmm. or do we need to? Or And can we realistically? Should, or it's like, in my mind, I read it as, should we do things that we can't be the best at? Yeah, there's an element of that. Like, uh, Cozy Grove has bug catching in it. As far as I know, there's only a handful of games out there with bug, bug catching and those audiences don't talk to each other very much. Right. And so like people playing bug catching are generally delighted with our bug catching, but they're also not comparing it to, you know, yeah. the best bug catching game in the past 20 years that I've been playing for 20 years and I love and I've devoted my life to it. Right. And um, I have muscle memory uh, for and yeah. I have this very fine grained sense of, of what it should feel like. Yeah. If we had added combat to Cozy Grove, which is a hilarious idea, it would probably would have delayed the project by, I don't know six to 12 months and i think people's perception of it is it would have been a dramatically worse game yeah so so yeah knowing knowing what you can execute on one of the constraints that we think about a lot is like what are we good at? and that's a really important thing like like i have this tendency my business partner david jokes that i i, I tend to like make stories about Maine and fishing and the weird like Cthulhu-esque things and like what just leave me alone with a game long enough and it will turn into that like that's just <laughs> it's just <laughs> you know and but there's a reason that happens is like I know that I can have a certain type of humor I know I can have a certain type of writing I know I can shift the game in that direction and I know how to make that a success with with the audience and so some of that is a risk reduction right because i creatively know i can make that type of game i'm going to push towards that because i know i can execute on it right right which yeah. it, which is also an interesting one and is something that i i can't remember who i was having this conversation with but talking about hades right which recently came out and was a big success you know and i don't mean this in a it's i think it's a great game and i think they're a great studio but they've kind of been making the same game with some diversions and side trips for a, a lot of years and in some ways hades is hades is something of a culmination of that right of this mm. kind of certain perspective there's combat and it feels good and there's beautiful art and there's great music and there's this kind of formula that they have just gotten really good at executing on. And then in that case, it's kind of like it's it's our type of game. This time it's procedural and there's this Greek mythology theme, right? And that, you yeah. know, those are the variations and then the rest is kind of the theme. Yeah. So early on in my career, I was all about like every game I make has to be wildly different. And I've worked on a lot of different genres. Like, you know, Triple Town was a puzzle game. I worked on a word game. We've worked on a couple different MMOs. We made an early, I, I guess they call them, do they call them production games? The Factorio style games. I mm -hmm. made, I made one of those. We've been, we've been all over the place in terms of in terms of games i made a roguelike puzzle game with i love this, that road not taken road not taken yeah with, love that with game. like that was super trippy i've been all over the place and sort of a, a slow realization is that game development is a craft and you kind of owe it to yourself to master the craft to get better at it and working within a genre getting better at that genre it may take you a couple decades it may take you a decade who knows like it yeah. depends on how how many chances you get at, at bat but it's worth getting better at a specific type of game and learning it inside and out and and executing that well there's nothing wrong with that even yeah. even if even if you lean towards innovation as your primary mode, like it's still okay to like become an expert at this particular thing. So like lately, so it's probably not apparent to people, but we've been kind of working on Animal Crossing style games for multiple games now, and uh, we we've we've learned we're we're getting slowly better at it, you know. And it's a broad enough it's a broad enough canvas that I feel like 
I'm not creatively constrained at all by it, but the team gets better. The art team gets better. The engineers get better. Our tooling gets better. And that makes the next game easier. And so there's these, these efficiencies that you get throughout the entire team. Cause it's not the game development, as you know, is, is, is sometimes it's an individual sport, but for the most part, it's a group sport. And as a group sport, you kind of want your team to improve and you kind of need a certain level of stability and through line in your projects in order for that to happen. I, I feel that very deeply, and I, and I think that this is why studio survival seems like an important goal, right? That, that yeah. building up that depth of experience within not just an individual, but within a team seems very important. And, and I think about, you know, there was a time when I was studying filmmaking and, and Akira Kurosawa and his kind of, he had the kind of group, same group of actors, same crew, and worked with them for like 20 years. And they did all kinds of stuff, you know, but there were a lot of familiar themes and a lot of familiar through lines. And, and over the years, it's just like, you know, Rashomon pops out and these films mm-hmm. pop out and you're like, you know, yeah. it's... it's uh, uh, this is, this is something that I would highly recommend. As someone who's been doing this for a while, I highly recommend finding your sort of creative pod, your, your collaborators, you know each other, you can rely on one another when things get tough, you know each other's capabilities, you know each other's weaknesses. And so when you're working on a project, you know, it's a, it's a coordination problem. And the more you know each other, the more easier that coordination problem becomes. And I think I think what happens is I always think of uh, there's this there's this idea of like the brain in in a space of scarcity, mm. and the and the brain in a space of plenty. And when you're constantly dealing with I don't trust people that I'm working with, and I don't know what they're capable of, and we don't have enough time, and we don't have enough money, and we're behind schedule, and blah 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 blah, your brain immediately gets into that place of scarcity, and creativity dies yeah. at that point, and 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 dark thoughts happen, and bad things happen. But if you can build this sort of foundation, this sort of safety net for you, creative safety net of people you know and trust, people you can rely upon decent amount of budget, decent amount of time, then you can actually be more creative. You can be more innovative. You can take more risks. You can do more interesting work. Like on Cozy Grove, we've released the game. It's selling fine. And at that point, I'm actually more excited about the work that we're doing on it than I was when we were when we were just making the first version. That's, uh, that's super interesting. I mean, so going into, because this is also, I mean, going back to the conversation we were having about kind of games as a service, as a model, like that in a, in a premium title like this, it's not what a lot of people would think about, about, okay, now we're kind of just moving into this next chapter of so continuing to support. I mean, what does that look like? Like, what are you all actually doing? Uh, so uh, we've got an update coming out where we just added, we added like 180 new bugs and we added a rock skipping mini game and we added uh, new clothing and new events. And there's, I think there's like 20, 20 medium to major features that we added and like, you know, like hundreds of hundreds of quality of life and bug fixes and stuff. The game, the game, like when it came out, the, the, the score was like uh, on Steam was like 70 something percent. Like it was like people were like, ah, it's, you know, it is a game and whatever. And now now we're at about 90 percent. So like, you know, we've been we've been just steadily working away at issues that people have but like it's this it's this whole canvas it's this this you know like we can add lots of new mini games we can add lots of new events we can add lots of new plot lines and storylines to the world it's a world that like even though there's like a hundred and i don't know 20 days worth of story in the game already there's like there's 365 days in the year, right? We have a lot more room to like layer on additional aspects of the lore. I don't know. It, it feels like it feels like you always have like when you make a game, you're like, we have to ship it out the door, and it's never what you imagine it should be. And with now, we have the opportunity to make this game into what it should be, right? Yeah. Which is, which is exciting to me as a creator. I know that's kind of amazing, and I think that's there's also an interesting design lesson or opportunity there in the sense that are you is the kind of skeleton of what you're building something that's amenable to that right yes is it can you is it a christmas tree that you can hang lots more stuff on or is it kind of like a 
closed system where it's like, well, it's the story ended, it's done, you know, not to yep. pick, not to pick on story games, right? Because actually, no, Ghost no, of Grove is, is kind of story rich, right? I mean, that's an interesting yep. one, right? It's not what I would call, I don't know, would you call it a linear story game? It does have a very linear story to it. It's told very slowly, but it does have a very linear story. But too. but it but it's also enough of a, of a world that you can layer more on top of it. There's lots of space for, for story. But yeah, you, like this goes back to our discussion about the sort of like design architectures. Like it took me a while. Initially, I had this idea that design should be tight, elegant, minimalist. And uh, what I realized, especially with Triple Town, because we worked on trying to open up, break open Triple Town and add more stuff to it for years. And it just wasn't amendable to that. That's what, very we, interesting. What, what we found is like, okay, that those tight, elegant designs are sometimes not friendly to this type of like long-term expansion. And so Road Not Taken, which you've played, was a puzzle game where I was like, I called it Baroque Design, where it's like, let's just throw stuff in there and like have lots of random objects and lots of random behaviors and like just be messy for once like i'm gonna stop i'm I'm gonna stop being so tight about my designs i'm going to intentionally be messy and as a result i felt there was a lot more space to add to that game one of my great regrets is that that game honestly needed about six to eight months more balancing Mm. but we had a we had a playstation release and we didn't have time and blah 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 and then that opportunity is left forever but making a game that is open enough to add to it you you like give yourself opportunities for in the future i think that's really really interesting and i think that the it's interesting well a couple things to pull for actually the other thing i want to go back to is what did you call them content chunks uh, uh yeah yeah sort of your templated content chunks i yeah. just i that was i just was about to say i want to grab three more things i was like wait there was a thing i wanted to grab from before and that was when what what do you mean by that can you unpack that a little bit sure so i'll give you an example from cozy grove which we yeah. just went through when we first started out we were making art and the art was all sorts of different sizes because it was like the art artist would draw something and it would be a size and that's the size it was and it turns out that i've been having all these private conversations about 2d isometric games 2d isometric games are from an art pipeline and a technology pipeline are in many ways more difficult than making a 3d game and you don't think of this because it's kind of like this dark area of the of the universe that like people have been making 2d isometric games for for decades clearly it's a solved problem you dig into it it's not a solved problem at all you get all sorts of weird super weird issues with z sorting exactly and yeah. and, and bitmaps don't compress well and like you've got memory issues and there's, there's all sorts of funky issues that happen with isometric games. and so because all of our art was all different sizes like we weren't solving one case of right. these problems. Right. We were solving this matrix of cases with lots of super weird edge cases. And it was and it, and it was one of the things, like that alone probably delayed the project by like three months. And so what we did is we said, okay, wait, we're gonna go, we're gonna map stuff onto a grid and we're gonna have like three, three versions of content or four versions of content there's going to be the one by one object yeah there's going to be the two by one object there's going to be the four by four object there's going to be the six by six object right and that's it and photoshop templates and we're going to put safe regions on those and not safe regions and then the artists who are super creative and wonderful people are going to draw within that and it turns out that giving an artist constraints does not make worse art it makes better art yeah so we ended up with great art that fit in these very easy to understand and manipulate chunks of content, these templated chunks of content. And then we could swap them. We could do all sorts of things with them. We actually gained more creative control and power by templatizing and uh, simplifying. And and as a result, like now stuff flows through the pipeline for uh, new art with, with, you know, it's self-managed essentially by the artists at this point. And, and all of our edge cases went away for the most part. Right. I mean, yeah. it's a system, right? It's a yeah. It's a content system as opposed to, hey, we've got this one huge tree and what are we going to do about it? All the other trees are, yeah. 
No, that yeah. that makes a lot of sense. That's that's very. Thank you for explaining that. That went by, and I wanted to talk about, but then there was something else interesting to talk about. There, so. There's there's an there's an article there's an article on Lost Garden that goes in for about twenty pages on this topic. Ooh, if you, perfect. De okay. If you desperately want, I will pick it up and link it in the description. I'll put. If you're watching on YouTube, yeah. I'll find it. I think I think that one is literally called content content architectures. Yeah. Amazing. Perfect. That's yeah. this is something I'm thinking about right now. So that's really helpful for me to think about. The I'm mindful of the fact that we're we're we've been talking for a while, so we'll start to come in for a landing. But the talk zigzagging back to what we were talking about, about things that you can kind of hang things on. This was something that Tanya Short wrote about, right, in her article about what did she call it? Something like in praise of messy design or which I loved. And I'm like, yes, somebody's advocating for messiness, which which is funny because I completely there's a huge part of me that loves this idea of this kind of beautiful, minimalist, tightly formed, everything extraneous has been removed, elegance, right? I mm -hmm. totally see the beauty of that. But actually, probably what I am personally drawn to is more like, and, and she used the, death strand, the example of Death Stranding. I think Road Not Taken is another great example of this, of this kind of shaggy design with yep. stuff hanging off it. And, and for me... I mean, this is a weird, I don't know why I keep, well, I, I did you spent years making music, so I keep making music analogies, but there's this thing in music where, especially in making dance music, which I was involved in for a long time, is you hear people make tracks, and it's got this, you can tell that they like obsessed over it anal retentatively, right? So it's mm -hmm. got this kind of overworked, airless kind of, either it's too much detail or it's got this kind of tightness to it that if you're trying to make music to make people dance and have a good time, in my opinion, just doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. is the feeling is like antiseptic and tight, right? Even mm -hmm. if all the formal elements, the beat is there and it's all doing what it's supposed to do, but there's just this kind of airtight feeling in it. And for me, on the game design side, the stuff that has this kind of like, whoa, it's a little wild and all over the place, but like it just feels more like a party to me. It's like more, there's this rich mm -hmm. messiness to it that I, I mean, I think just aesthetically connect with, but I don't know. It's, I, I totally respect the super tight stuff, but I'm like, actually, I don't know. Yeah. This is, there's a richness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. And and creative, creatively, it, it lets you those open those open little ended aspects to it that are not tightly defined and dependent on everything else in a tight fashion. Lets you like add to things. It's it's it's. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of connections with like code and you know tight coupling and things like that here as well. It's it's funny. Like a lot of the like I've always been curious like where certain aesthetics come from. And the uh, the incredibly elegant design. I have a theory, which is that it comes from board games and mathematics. And and board games and mathematics, there's a very specific constraint on why those prefer elegant things, and that is the human mind's ability to keep a rule set in its head. Yeah. And board games, you have this very limited space to keep a board a, a rule set in your head and your amount of like computational processing on the rule set is incredibly limited you have to explain the rule set you have to share it with people that you have to play it like and if you add in like tons and tons of rule books like board games just fall apart yeah. they just stop they stop working if you add in tons of computational scorekeeping and stuff the board game just falls apart right. so there's this very natural like constraints of that system it's really nice to have an elegant rule set. It's really nice to like pare it down to like the minimum you need. Same goes for mathematics. Like it, you know, mostly back in the day, people were doing it in their head. They were doing it on paper, and there were ways that they could sort of you know scaffold that up. But the simpler you could make it, the better everyone's lives it made. It made everyone's lives better. But with games, games we have computers, and computers allow us to be complex and messy and track things and like you know there's some data there's a couple megabytes of data off there in the on the hard drive someplace that really don't matter until you've been playing for three months and that's fine that's totally fine so right. why not embrace it right and i mean i think also yeah no i agree and i think that i i love the board game comparison because there's also going back to kind of constraints of media and format 
most board games, with the exception of something like D and I don't know if you even call it a board game, right? But but will not be played over days and weeks and months, right? Whereas mm-hmm. a, whereas a video game, that's totally normal that you might play something for three months, a, you know, a little bit every day, and and which gives you time, just like a twelve hour or 48 hour Netflix series gives you time to build up this super complex mental model and know mm-hmm. who all the characters are and know mm-hmm. what all these complicated build muscle memory. And so there is kind of just a, a bigger canvas to paint on because of the time investment people are making. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. I think that's really, really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, it's funny because I think when I saw Tanya's article, it was just a couple of months ago or something, I felt like, I don't know, I think I felt, <laughs> I don't know why I think this, but there's something virtuous seeming in this kind of elegant design, right? Like there's something like, it seems more disciplined. You know, you think about like like I, you know, growing up I used to play Go with my dad, you know, and mm-hmm. I, and I Go to me is like kind of it's like the ultimate version of this, right? It's just like almost nothing, it's, you know, like mm-hmm. it's two stones and then a universe explodes out of it. You know what I mean? Like I think it's a wonderful style of design. I really, I still like it. Yeah, right. I, I mean, I, we can have both, right? We don't have to put you, them can, you can, you can, yeah. you can, you can, you can absolutely have both. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was actually at the the lunch conversation with Tanya when we were talking about the scruffy and everything. So it's a great article. Everyone should read that. Yeah. Really recommend it. Yeah, I'll, and I'll link it down in the description. That's phenomenal. Well, I think that's a nice point to to come in for a landing. So everybody should go and check out Cozy Grove, which is out now on Steam. It's terrific. I highly recommend it, especially if you like beautiful and relaxing kind of little places to visit on a regular basis. And lostgarden.com is the URL for your blog, right? Highly recommend everybody to visit there. We've got Dan's Twitter handle on the screen. If you're on YouTube, if you're not, it's at Dan C. The Duck. Where does that come from, by the way? <laughs> so so it's, 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 it's Dank the Duck. I used to sign all my art because I used to do art in back in the day, a D-A-N-C. And it's interesting, like no one calls me Dan, just, just so you know. I'm, I'm, either, I'm, either, I'm either Daniel or Dank. People from Europe call me Donk. Because I, I, I don't know why, but there it is. They don't have um, the nasal American A, the dink. They don't yeah. do it. They don't do it. Yeah. It's donk for sure. It's donk. So, so yeah, so I, I throughout my life, like people who knew me from IRC channels and online knew me as as, as, as dank for, for years. And then they would meet me in person. And it's like, oh, your name is actually not dank. You know, like, and, and the Dan C thing is something that's emerged relatively recently. And I don't know why. That's like, it's, it's sort of a, it's a new, it's a new, it's a new naming phenomenon. And I'm like, oh, that's a weird one. But yeah. It's, oh, good. Yeah. Well, thank you for correcting me then, because I would have gone around saying it wrong. That's excellent. Yeah. Well, it's written. It's ri- If you read it on Twitter, I would. Yeah. You know, your name is Dan. Co- is Daniel yes, Cook? That, right? Yes. It's yeah. I think, yeah. Like, oh, it's a, it's I, and a, and I think that was part of it because for for the most part, like I would sign things when I wasn't anonymous. I would sign things dank, and then yeah. people never associated it with the Daniel Cook because Daniel Cook was never never visible anywhere like actually coming out and having my name be daniel cook is something that's happened probably in the last like i don't know 10 years or so got but, it got it amazing i love it awesome yeah well yeah thank you so much for for taking the time it's been absolutely illuminating i've super enjoyed it and and i hope that the audience does as well and uh, yeah everybody check out thanks projects and and hopefully we can do it again sometime all right sounds good take thanks, care man. all right bye